welcome back to episode three of Birmingham Sports Podcast. So we got Russ and Gunner over here, myself, Ethan. And yeah, so introduce yourselves real quick. Uh, my name is Gunner. Uh, I'm a junior at Sanford in Birmingham. Yeah. Um, been with Birmingham Sports writing on the blog for a while now, but moving to this podcast, man, it's exciting. And then uh, I'm Russ. I'm a junior at UAB in uh, journalism. I've been working with Birmingham Sports since last June. And now, we're work- again, like Gunnar said, we're on the podcast. It's been a blast. Yeah, and uh, my name's Ethan. I'm a junior in high school around Birmingham. Started this whole thing up. Excited for this podcast, you know. Uh, yeah, man. Just exciting times, though. But uh, we got a lot of stuff to cover this week. So just jump right in here. Let's go uh, first off. Barron's talk. Not much, really. Uh, I mean, same same thing. Uh, except the delay is expected maybe a little bit longer because of the CDC recommendation, you know, no gatherings 50 plus until May 10th. So they're talking mid June start. I mean, same old stuff. What we've been hearing the last two weeks, but I mean, your guys thoughts on like, uh, you got any thoughts on the effects that this will have on the Baron? I mean, you have to feel like this is going to be pushed to a shorter season. I mean, whether the Major League Baseball does that for first or the, the minors shift to that, I feel like they're just not going to have time to fit in 160 to 180 game season come October. There's no way. I can see us moving now to like a 100 game season, and that's even stretching it. Maybe like a 75 game season, but it's going to be shorter. I think the season's going to happen, but it's not going to be full length. There's no way. Yeah, and they've already... uh. There's been talks about canceling the draft due to money and time restraints now. So, I mean, that's just something to keep an eye out. But, I mean, uh, the guys, it's interesting because I've heard that uh, minor leaguers don't get paid right now. No, the they are getting paid. Until they the are. Day. There was a statement issued a few days ago um, oh, okay. by the administration saying that they were going to get paid. They didn't announce how much they're getting paid or what the, the basis is for doing that, but they did say they were getting paid. All right, that's good. I heard that they weren't. So, mm-hmm. but, but I, I mean, if I take a guess, I imagine it's less than their full contract, which uh, which is oh, our yeah. a rough place. Is, like, yeah, it's not it's not good. But good thing, uh, what is it? Luis Robert got paid already whenever he moved up to Charlotte. Yeah, but uh, okay. I mean that's pretty much it for the Barons. If you want to move in right into the Bulls, I mean big news: SPHL canceled season. Uh, I mean, honestly, this came as a surprise to me. They just wiped out the playoffs altogether. But as it stood, the Bulls were sit- sitting in ninth place, so mm-hmm. right below that playoff line. So it could be a good thing for the Bulls, honestly. Yeah, I mean, they were struggling with form. But, I mean, obviously it sucks that it has to be canceled like that. But there was a decent chunk, like, what, 10 games left in the season that were yes. canceled. And then the playoffs, I mean, from a fan perspective, I mean – kind of hurts not to be able to finish it and see how the Bulls would have finished if they would have clinched a spot or not. But, I mean, it's just – it is what it is, honestly. There's not much you can do about, do about that. Maybe the Bulls could have picked, turned it around, gotten a, like, eight or seventh seed in the playoffs. Now it's make a little bit of a run. But I don't think they would have gone back to the finals like last year. Mm. And especially that goaltending, that was the big issue I saw the entire time. Um, I hope the – I hope the league itself had enough uh, funds set aside to be able to survive this. Because with the league as small as SPHL, it probably does, it does put them in a rough place. But I'm sure I'm sure they'll be okay, and I will see how they bounce back next year. Oh yeah, we'll... go, going to that fun thing. Uh, I saw that the Bulls they auctioned off their St. Patty's jerseys, okay, that they didn't even wear, wow. and raised ten grand. Wow! So like they oh, they make okay. bank. They're they're fine. They they have so many of those uh, what is it special jersey nights and yeah. events like that, and they're they're not going under any time soon. Sure. At all. Sure. But I mean, definitely a disappointing uh, into a season. Uh, overall, really, just a disappointing season after that last year, that amazing run where they lost Huntsville. But it is what it is. Come back next season. Uh, hopefully, get like guys like Josh Harris back, the MVP from last year. That's another interesting. Thing that I'm gonna keep an eye out for is if they're gonna have MVP, you know, stuff like that. Because it'd be interesting to see who it is since it is the season's ten games shorter and playoffs, you know, no playoffs. So, but I don't know. But I mean, that's pretty much it for Bulls. I mean, very short week for Bulls and Barons. But Legion Gunner, I know you're excited for this. 
but a little bit of damper on this situation. May 10th, until the season starts. Minimum. I know. I don't know if that's going to be pushed back or not. I mean, only time will tell. I mean, that's the same with all professional sports right now across the globe. But, I mean, from a perspective of just being in the USL, I mean, they're going to follow the MLS and basically everything. So, we'll just have to wait and see. And, I mean, I was really excited for the season. I mean, I wouldn't have been in Birmingham for the first game, but the, the second week against uh, Miami, I would have been there. So, I mean, just have to wait it out, I guess. It def- it hurts. I was looking forward to this season. I had tickets to the uh, opener against Charleston. That has to get pushed back. I understand I understand it has to get pushed back, but it's definitely a le- it's definitely a disappointment. I was ex- I was excited. I asked off the first like four games of the season of off work. I mean it's giving me a little time to record now, but I'd rather be at a game, honestly. Yeah, oh, just yeah. The, thing, the virus itself, it's like it's hard to be inside and not like have sports or something to watch on TV or just like oh, yeah. I if I'm by myself, like I'll go and like I don't know, shoot a basketball or go to like a soccer field and kick around. But like, there's like, you're so limited in what you can actually do without sports right now. Oh yeah. It's even to the point where they're shutting down local fields and it's crazy because of this whole thing. But I mean, looking at the games that we, that are postponed that we're losing because of this is uh, we played Char- we're losing our Charleston and Miami at home the first two weeks. And then we got Memphis away, which I was looking forward to that one. Definitely. You know, the rivalry. Then we're losing Pittsburgh away. So Brett, uh, his return game back to Pittsburgh. We're losing our Open Cup game, obviously, in Chattanooga. The one that I'm really disappointed about is we're losing our Louisville game. That that hurt. And then uh, ATL at home, going to North Carolina, we're losing Philly 2 at home, and Red Bulls in New York. Those some are the games we're losing. Really decent teams on that list, too. So there would have been yeah. some really good games. Like One perk is, though, Saturday, May 16th, if that is the opening weekend for us, we play St. Louis at home. So that'll be a good matchup. For sure. That's a fun game. But, I mean, going through these games, what, like, the biggest game you guys think that we're losing? Out of all this? Probably just, like, from a fan supporter thing, I think you have to go with Memphis right now just because of how, like, things have escalated over the last, like, month. Like, it's oh, just yeah. fun to follow with everything going on. But, like... For bragging rights, I think that's the biggest game right now. Because, like, in the USL, not a lot of, like, rivalries, like, actual rivalries, like, come about. But, like, now one did. So, that's the biggest, in my opinion. And then, uh, for me, I got two I got two teams on this one. I'm going to say Memphis as well. Just for, again, like, a, from a fan's point of view, just how big the rivalry has gotten. Just how much two cities hate each other. And then you go back to the UAB and Memphis. They hate each other. So, I mean, it ties all in. And then from... I guess a skill perspective. I really did want to see us play uh, Red Bulls too, just because how great the New York Academy has been over the years. It's always a good proving ground to see. Okay, half these guys on New York Red Bulls too are gonna be on the Red Bulls here in the next probably like few months, and I I like seeing how we stack up against that. Now with the Red Bulls game, was that home or away? It was away. Because I was going to say, last year, we just got thrashed away 5-0. I know it was raining, the weather was awful, and it was early in the season. But just, like, to see how, like, our own team's progression would have been against Red Bulls. Because, I mean, they're always a solid team every single year. So, that would have been a good basis for development. And then I'm pretty yeah, sure last year we played them. We, they had uh, current MLS stars. I think Tom Barlow was on that squad when we played them. I want to uh, – I can't – there was a – There was a there was like three I know that got pulled up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because they got pulled up like a week later. Yeah, uh, what is it? We play them at home, though, uh, Saturday, July 18th. So and we still got that game in the summer. Last year would have been a one nothing win, I think, with a goal from, like, Brian Wright on a header, probably, if I remember uh, correctly. Or was that against Indy 11? I'm not sure. I'm forgetting that game. I don't know. I know the New York game last year at home, it got, like, it was that crazy game where it got, like, rained out. Already yeah. in, like halfway into the game or something. Yeah, it was like and then minutes it pushed, and pushed and it out. Pushed and moved to, uh, moves was like August or something like that. Yeah, are there is there any talk still about moving the two sides down to League One? Uh, from what I've heard, I think they're still like discussing it, but I haven't heard anything concrete. Mm-hmm. Uh, gotcha. Because that's definitely an interesting point. Because if you think those uh, two sides, all the two sides move down, it might allow for another like a uh, franchise to pop up somewhere. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, 
one, well, talking about, I'm going to go off track a little bit here, but talking about future franchises, I just want to mention this. Uh, one area that I'm excited for to get a USL team in the Eastern Conference is uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Okay. There's a couple of reasons for this. Um, I don't know if you've seen renderings of their stadium. It's amazing. It's like a uh, stadium on the waterfront with a shopping center, first off. So it's going to help the economy so much. And two, the Red Sox AAA team were in Pawtucket, but then they moved up uh, to Massachusetts. So Pawtucket doesn't have any sports team besides this team that's coming in. I don't know what year exactly. But they said basically to the Red Sox AAA team, adios amigo, we have this uh, USL franchise coming in. And so that's, nothing's been released about them yet except that it's going to be in Pawtucket and stadium design. So that's going to be definitely a team that I'm excited to see how they form. I was going to say, though, track, but... even, though, even though it was AAA baseball, I mean, the Paw Sox were huge with, like, fans and stuff. Like, they had great turnouts and everything. So I'm like, as a perspective on the actual city – if a USL team were to go there, they would have so much support. Oh, yeah, definitely. Were they, were they called the Paw Sox? They were. The Red Sox. I love but that. Just like, yeah. <laughs> they're, uh, they were the Pawtucket Paw Sox, and then now they're moving up to Worcester in Massachusetts, so they're called the Woo Sox. Yeah. So, but, I mean. You can use those out there for a second. What would you say? The Woo Sox. The Woo Sox? <laughs> Uh, That's what they're called now, the Wu Sox. Oh. Okay, I want to move into off-season signings since we haven't heard from Gunner on this topic yet. Mm -hmm. Who do you think uh, is going to have the most impact of the off-season signings? That's a really, really tough question because it's it's tough for me to answer with the different positions. But I think all in all, I'd have to go with Nico Brett because um, just his impact against us last year, I feel like he's he's fitting in really well in training. Um, and just he was a guy that was kind of I don't want to say like overlooked at Pittsburgh, but like he didn't have I don't think he played his full potential unless it was against us scoring four four goals yeah. in the one game playoffs. But super excited about Brett. Um, I think on the defensive end, I'd say uh, Krugnale because from what I've seen against Atlanta United in that game, obviously the other two games we didn't have access to. The game against Atlanta, he performed really, really well. Looked super solid at center back. And that was a position going in because of the torn ACL injury to Laurent. I mean, we didn't really know. It was kind of up for grabs. And our defense was kind of shaky. But he stepped up in that preseason game. And he looked really, really good. Oh, yeah. You want to piggyback off that, Russ? With Krognale, I'm just excited to have more backs in the lineup right now. Because, again, last year our defense wasn't wasn't great. We had, we had issues – with uh, we go down, we could go down two goals early in the game, and then just we never really had the offensive uh, structure to recover from it. And getting a MLS veteran like Krugnale, I think that was a solid signing. Excited, I'm excited to see more of him. Uh, whenever we are able to see more of him, and I think he was one of my favorite signings of the offseason. Oh yeah, I couldn't agree with you more there. But uh, I think personally, Nico Brett obviously you can't deny what he does, what he brings to that attack. Everybody overlooks his assist rate. I don't know them exactly, but the guy puts up assists with the goals he puts up. Like yeah. it's very hard to come by those types of guys, especially in the USL, uh, that can assist and score them. So I feel like I honestly feel like he could be the MVP preseason MVP prediction. I think Brett would be a great idea. If not, if Kasim and I could probably get into this later, but if Kasim converted even half the chances he had last year with, like, scoring goals. Because he was good with assists, too. But, I mean, just the chances he missed. Like, and he he easily won team MVP with the Legion last year. But just what he, like, his potential is so insane. And I think this year, if he steps it up, I mean, he's got this one year um, in America now playing with the Legion. I think he's... He's going to be ready to improve for sure. Oh, yeah. No, uh, it was what there was one game that we were all three at that I think Kasim missed five like one on one chances in a single game. And you were ready to just start screaming, Gunner. It yeah. was you were not a happy camp for that game. And I know that happened um, in the Tampa Bay game when they beat their on the uh, Poku goal when they won one nothing. 
he had chances near the end that he missed at least two or three. But this was a home game. I think it was against Indy 11, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong with that, but I think that was him. And just for him him to miss those one-on-one chances, I mean, it was, like, unacceptable for me because, like, Though we could have used those goals, I mean, just for like stability, because with a team like Indy Eleven, even though they were playing a man down, like they were threatening us the entire game. Especially what was it? Wasn't it the Indy Eleven game that Laurent went down with that ACL? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So like the, that, that in those that moments, you need to just score it. Femi's game being brought in at center back because of that. That might have been, and then from the rest of the season, that was what it was because they, they were like shifting Cromwell to defense too at the same time. But then they they pushed him more so to the outside as an outside back and then put Femi at center back for the rest of the season. Yeah, and I want to know what uh, happened to Culbertson. That's what I want to know what happened. It's like nobody ever talked about it. He just vanished out of midair. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's an, it, like, it's an issue with the entire USL, like just not having enough coverage on stuff. But like you hear about guys that, and it's like, what even happened to them? You don't know. Because obviously you hear about the retirements. I'm still upset about DJ retiring, obviously. Not me retiring because he's from my hometown. But just, it's stuff like that. Like these guys are 24, 26 years old. Like you can't blame them if they have opportunities. Kyle Fisher too. If they have opportunities for like a uh, higher income somewhere else, but at the same time, it's like these guys were good for us last year, especially um, DJ. Especially DJ. DJ was definitely the catalyst for so many games. Like especially that Memphis shot, crazy. That was insane. Even his goal, his goal against Atlanta United too, where I mean the defense was awful. But, like, for him to weave like that and just be, like, so elusive and then just have that clean finish right over the keeper, like, that was just insane. And then having that perfect corner against Memphis the first time and then dancing in the box for a whole, like, almost mid of the second time. <laughs> Crazy yeah. what he could do. He just, like, pulls stuff out of nowhere. But that's, I feel like that's what, I don't, we don't have a guy exactly like him this year. And we don't have a, do you guys feel like we've, Filled the void for DJ with the midfielders we brought in with the likes of Lafa and Akinyode, even though Akinyode is not the same type of player as DJ. I was going to say, like, Akinyode is just like so, like, I would rely on him a lot more for defense compared to like Daniel Johnson. But, like, at the same time, there is like no one that I, in my opinion, that I've seen be as elusive as DJ was in the midfield, being like able to create like that. And I think that could be an issue for us because, like, Having DJ on the field um, last year, like he was just such a creator, and I mean, it opened up so much on the field. Like we could we could spread out the field and just have him go to work in the middle, and it'd be like chances. One thing that they might try to do uh, in the ATL game, I know they put Kasim out wide, and mm-hmm. in that DJ position, uh, because more Kasim was more playing down the middle and on the left more than the right last season, but they slapped him out on the right, which was really where DJ was a lot last season. So, I mean, maybe they could be trying to mold Prosper to take over that DJ role. Who knows? That's just I mean, my two cents on it. Not, like I, I mean, think, it's, it's maybe. Because, I mean, Kasim, I want to say Kasim is definitely faster than DJ, but, like, skill-wise, I don't know. I mean, I can't really say that. Nobody can match that, probably. Or DJ had. Probably not. But uh, I... I don't know how they're going to – that the system is definitely going to be shifting, in my opinion, this year, especially with the likes of Akinyode coming in, having him along with uh, Asidu. That's okay. going to be the one-two punch. Definitely one of the best uh, midfield partnerships in the USL, in especially my opinion. Defense. I mean, when you talk about defense, I mean, both of those guys are just so solid. Like, even for – I mean, Asidu's size, I mean, it is ridiculous to see, like, how he goes into challenges and wins challenges and then moves forward. Because, I mean, he is surprisingly fast, too, for his size. He plays like a six six guy. He plays like Akinyode does. Yeah, honestly. But yeah. in that small body. It's crazy. Um, I, I'm i intrigued to see if, we're, if we might move our entire, like, I guess system to like say like a like a four two 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 with a two, like two attack like almost two we're playing two strikers two out wide mids and then two defensive mids with uh so Akinyode and Asidu are partner down low. That's, I that's, I see that that's something that I can see we doing. I can see us doing this year. One thing I do want to touch on is uh 
Jonathan Dean signed with the team, a uh, guy out of UCF and drafted by Orlando City this year, a right back, and he can play a little bit of center back, I think. But I wonder if he's just going to come at, come in and take over that Mikey Lopez role. I don't think he's going to take over that Mikey Lopez role. He's going to slot in as a backup. But later on in the season, who knows, maybe he becomes the starting right back. Lopez shifts up to midfield again, like we saw him at the beginning of last year. And I honestly prefer that because if you think about it, Lopez had some solid uh, goal scoring ability for us last year. And I mean, for us, I don't want to say to waste him at right back because he did a decent job playing right back the whole year after he was moved. But I just I feel like he is one of those guys who has that MLS experience who could score some goals and just like from that midfield area, just kind of break through. Yeah. What do you think about the trust? Um, With Mikey, I don't. I mean, I don't want Mikey to be down at a, as a back. I, I would like him in the kind of like just kind of like central. But he definitely has the ability to go down and play a back, as we did see last year, like you said. And I, I guess this year from Mikey, I, I, just, I guess I just want to see more, uh, more of like a leadership role out of him. He has the experience. He has the years. He's been on the clubs. Just really take that next step and, and basically just show up and say, I'm the guy. I'll lead you all. And basically just help out all we have we do have a lot of youth on the team this year and and basically do a good job helping them out. Did uh did Mikey have the most uh captain appearances for us last year? He, That's he did what I was about to say. Yeah. That's what I wanna know. Who is the captain this year? That's gonna be interesting. I mean, I don't you have so many people who could be. I mean, even Van Oakle, I feel like they that are getting the, the captaincy too. But I mean, if Lopez, I mean, Lopez was just that guy probably most involved with the community. Um, just basically last year becoming the face of the Legion and like the number one, like for fans and stuff, always coming over after uh, games to the fan section, posing for photos and whatnot. So he was really, really well liked. Oh, yeah. If I remember correctly, wasn't he the first ever captain? Like uh, wore the armband he the was. first game? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you mentioned Movo there, Matt Van Oakle, mm-hmm. the number one. What are your thoughts on him this year, on the goalkeeping situation as a whole with uh, Spangenberg, Van Oakle, and the new guy? Uh, I don't know any. I don't. What's the, I don't even know the new guy's name. I forgot it. But he's from where? Santa Clara, maybe. It just blanked my mind. What is his name? Oh, and, uh, Ford Parker. Mexico. Ford Parker. That's yeah, what his he name. played in Mexico, right? In college. Uh, I believe he I played for New so. Mexico and then transferred to UC Irvine. Irvine was it, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. uh, uh, Cusero is from uh, Santa Clara. But no, I mean, I don't know enough to speak on him. And we barely saw Spangenberg last year. But, I mean, Spangenberg has had a pretty, pretty solid USL career in general, even the times he's played in Puerto Rico. Um, but Spangenberg did really, really well against oh, Pittsburgh, yeah. if you can remember that game. And that was a game we – I mean, our effect – like, we weren't affected – our playoff standings weren't affected at all by that game. So they let Spangenberg play. Um, But he did really, really well. He made some huge saves that game. And I don't see him at this point overtaking Van Oakle because Van Oakle is another one of those guys that people absolutely love and fans absolutely love. And um, I mean, I've, I've criticized Van Oakle before about some of his like actual, like technical stuff. In, in between the posts, but he he makes big saves like when he needs to. Like if you think about it, he was really really sure handed. He never had any like howlers or awful awful errors like some goalkeepers in the USL did. Um, I also think MVO's uh, distribution is super super underrated. His distribution is really solid. He was really good at getting things moving again, whether that would be rolling the ball out. Or just ha- like he had some insane punts too that just really, really got us moving forward. Um, so I can't really say that his technical, his diving ability is something that's going to bring down his ability in general. Even though some goals are so obvious that like he gets scored on because he didn't do this or because he just fell straight down. Like sure, it's really easy for me to criticize that, but at the same time, he came up clutch a bunch of times last year. That that like in super super important games and super important moments, um, I think the biggest save he made last year, in my opinion, was against Memphis 
because right after DJ scored, I don't know if you guys remember, two minutes later, Memphis came roaring down the field and put just a low shot on goal, and he went down to his left. And it was one of the most beautiful saves, because I feel like he is so much better diving to his right than his left. I'm not sure if he would agree with that, but especially going aerial, it is like such a, like a present, like just so obvious for him, so much more solid going right than left. But he dove left low to the ground and just made one of the biggest saves of the year. So I don't see Spangenberg overtaking uh, Van Oko at this point. I don't want to like say that's final and I want to leave this like competition open as any team should, but I feel like going forward, he's the guy. I, I definitely do agree that he is the guy. I think Spangenberg performed well enough last season to earn himself a few more appearances this year. I, I, I think Spangenberg can make, like, I think he made five appearances last year. He could bump up to, like, seven or nine this year, depending on who we're playing and uh, how Matt's feeling. I think I think Ford's going to really gonna be the one that really struggles to find any playing time behind both of them. He might be who we use in the in – the, well, actually, no, never mind. I forgot the Open Cups. Uh, we pulled out the Open Cup, so I, was I don't, say. I don't know. Then I don't know when Ford's going to find playing time. Then actually, see, Spangenberg played last year primarily, and this is outside of um, Open Cup match play with us, uh, because he didn't even play against Louisville when we lost to them. That was, that was still Van Ockel, but he played against uh, the Westchester. If you guys remember that game, um, when a poku but, went off. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I remember that game so well with Apoku's to- two goals. I mean, he was clutch that game. And that was the game that made me wish that he played more all year long because he was electric in some of those games, Tampa Bay 2 and the USL. But um, I don't see – if Van Ockel doesn't get injured, that could be reason for Spangenberg to maybe only see the field like once or twice. But, I mean, think about it last year. Van Ockel went down with a foot injury, I think it was. I could be wrong, or like an ankle injury or something like that. And then Spangenberg instantly just came in, played at least like four or five games. And he did he did pretty well. I mean, that was a time where the Legion were struggling in general with their form. But I think he did well. So, I mean, it's still, it's kind of a toss-up. But, like, I still think Van Ockel, if he's not injured, would get the go-ahead. See, the way I look at this Ford Parker signing is Van Ockel and Spangenberg are up there in age. So, say... This might be Van Oakle's last year. Uh, they bring Ford in. They can groom how they want to. You've got to have some quality to make the roster, obviously. So he's got to have something in there uh, that uses his advantage. So I believe that maybe he could slot into that backup role next year. Let's just say Moho retires. Uh, Spangenberg moves up to that number one, or they bring in another number one. Let's say Spangenberg leaves, you know. He slots in that backup any of those ways, you know. Might just be one of those types of moves planning for the future, which is always good to do. But uh, I want to move on. Uh, back line, we already touched on right back, but left back and center back, I want to start off with left back. Razak Cromwell has a, been the person that's impressed me the most this preseason. By far, the dude looks sharp. The dude looks fast. I was talking to him after uh, the ATL game. I was like, man, you look so sharp. First preseason game. He's like, really, man? I'm like, yeah. And what I take from that is he wasn't 100%. So I'm hoping he wasn't 100%. But he's a guy that can set this. USL championship on fire, I believe, this season. Uh, with Culbertson not being in the back line anymore, he can be that guy getting extremely far forward and tracking back. He's got the speed to do it. Uh, he's my one to watch on the back line this year, definitely. I agree 100%, um, primarily because of his speed. Like you mentioned, it's just so evident on the field. Like, the dude can fly. The one area I want to see Cromwell get better, free kicks. We gave him so many chances to score, and he never, I mean, aside from maybe one or two shots, he never even put the ball on target in, like, really, really good free-kick scoring chances. Like, I mean, that was all season long. We basically gave him those chances. So if he can develop a solid free-kick, testing the goalie every single time, or at least getting, like, somewhat close to the frame of the goal, I think the dude could be a stud. He definitely has the athleticism for it. He has the, he has the speed for it. He just got. He has he needs. He needs to fix that technical ability, like yours. Like he needs to. He needs to work on his technicality a little bit more. Work on his dribbling a little bit. Uh, fix those free kicks. That was again. That was a big issue. That was something that really frustrated you last year me as well. Um, because it was every. It was almost every single free kick we gave him, and like you said, it was never 
it was never close. There was nothing. There was never really a free kick where all that could have gone in. It was usually just ten yards wide of the goal, hitting the hitting the little rebound net, and everyone's running the opposite way. And like I was gonna say, with the free kicks, the only other guy I kind of remember having that impact on free kicks was Kobayashi. And he put some really good balls in. Like that was my best memory of Kobayashi, like those super close free kick goals. But after he was injured, it was Cromwell from that point on. Yeah, Cromwell definitely is like in my opinion, he's got all the tools you need, just needs to sharpen it up. And I believe he didn't start the season with us last year. He like came in mid season yep. or something. I think so, he got his visa late last year, so he had to come in a little later. Yeah, so like this first full off season, even though uh, it's kind of messed up a little bit, but this is first. He's got a he's got that half year year under his belt now, and he knows what the game's like in America. So to come back, same as Prosper, you know, you got the tools. You just need to sharpen up a little bit. Uh, with Pro- the same way with Prosper's uh, finishing in front of goal, Rod like needs to get those three kicks on target. Uh, sharpen up a little bit more. And I mean, the dude is a beast, honestly. Like for being so technically raw, like it is impressive to see what he can do on the field. And the dude, like like I said, he is just so fast. He's probably the fastest guy on the team. I would would put money on that. But talking about beast, let's move, uh, what is it? Johannes Bergman, an absolute beast out of Maryland. I mean, the guy, uh, trialist against ATL, uh, I, I noticed him. Was it because he had his name on the back of his kit? Uh, Dylan Cerna and uh, who else? Or all the other trialists like Bruno Lapa, whenever they came on, didn't have their name. And I was like, who's that guy with the with the name on the back of his kit? I think it was but, uh, him. W- was Jaden signed at that point, or was he still a trialist at that point? Because he Jaden also had Jaden had it on the back of his uh, jersey too, but I'm not J- sure if that Jaden was Jaden was straight up signed. He didn't even trial with the team, as far okay. as I know, he didn't. But, uh, yeah, Johannes, I mean, I would not want to match up 1v1 against that guy any day of the week. Uh, he was first team All-America, right, at Maryland? Yeah. Or he is that for, I'm not Because I know he was – there were a bunch of different outlets, news outlets that put together first team teams. But I know first team Big Ten for sure, so that's impressive. And uh, I want to say – because I wrote an article about it for, uh, for the blog – and I did some research, and just to watch some of his his highlights, he is a stud on the back line for sure. Yeah, and he uh, was I know he's captain Maryland in his final year there, and he won a national championship with him, so he's got that pedigree behind him, right. which is always good. Russ, I wasn't able, I wasn't able to go to the ATL game. I really watched much of the preseason, so I can't comment too much on Bergman. But I will say from the little from the clips I've seen. He's definitely an exciting signing that I like. I like to see develop. Yeah, I can definitely yeah. see him uh, starting alongside uh, Krog Krognale. Is that how you say it? Yeah, still got all the names down. Krognale, uh, Bergman, and Krognale to start the season, and then uh, until Laurent comes back, and then Laurent slide in, and Bergman might drop down. But hey, you never know. Bergman could impress so much that he stays in that starting role. You never know. It's anybody's game. Laurent's one of those guys that was super like I was annoyed watching him early on last season because of how many free kicks, how many times he got beat in, inside the box as a last defender. But he was one of those guys. He was absolutely my most improved player last year. The way he oh, yeah. turned things around, he became our best defender. So I want to see, because after the injury against Indy 11, we never saw him again, obviously. So he will be one of those guys I am super stoked about seeing return but at the same time, I want to know if, what's his form going to be like. Is he going to pick up where he left off? Is it going to take him some time? I mean, obviously, it's going to take him some time with an ACL injury. But just he was one of those guys that was so reliable near the end of the season before he was injured. Laurent, maybe. He was my favorite defender last year. He was, like you said, most improved player for me easily. I think Laurent's one of our guys that I can – him, it would it would have been him and DJ if DJ hadn't retired. Our two like young stars that we can really build around, mm-hmm. guys that you are, that are going to become stars in the league. That are that can that you can easily see going up to the next level if if they get the opportunity. And with you said, yeah, like crazy when, to see Laurent came like out. I was going to yeah. say when you did it like that, that kind of makes you want a young goalie, one of those guys <laughs> like we can build around defensively. 
um, rather than a dude in his 30s and his mid 30s, because like moving forward, as long as, you know, the Legion remain in existence, I keep one. I want to bring in young stars and just build around that, like you said. Yeah, I couldn't agree more on that because what is it? Uh, I mean, how old is Bergman? Mid 20s? 20, 23, 24? 24. Right, that's, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking that. Uh, but uh, Bergman and Laurent, honestly, Crognale, I love them and stuff, but Bergman and Laurent, I could see those guys, that, that pairing, even though Crognale is only like 26 or something, you know? Mm. I could definitely see Bergman and Laurent getting some games this upcoming season together with Cognale coming off the bench. Like Cognale, he's going to definitely start. That's I'm not that's, I'm not saying that he's not going to start. He's going to be that uh, centerpiece for that back line, especially until Laurent comes back. But once Laurent comes back, I feel like those three guys battling it out. It's every man for himself. Uh, best man wins the job. Yeah, but uh, I want to move on. Uh, shift up to the attack. The one part we haven't talked about yet of the uh, well and Kobayashi, I guess. Kobayashi plus attack. Let's start off with Kobayashi thoughts on bringing back the old man on the roster. What is he? Thirty-seven now. Is that correct? 30, 30, 30, 37, like twentieth season, I believe. Something around there. Crazy. Goodness. And I mean, I think it's good to have a guy of his age, like in terms of leadership. But I mean, at the same time, like he showed, he showed glimpses. Of something promising, like like a former MLS like impact player, but I mean at the same time he was his speed is shot, his free kicks were decent. Like he delivered some really great corners and um, free kick balls that could help us. But I mean at the same time on on the pitch, I feel like our goal is to use our speed to like our advantage, and he's not one of those guys that could assist that. Oh no! Oh no! Um, I mean, I'm glad his free kicks were pretty good last year. I mean, he's had 20 years of pro soccer to develop those, so I'd hope he'd uh, perfect them a little bit. I mean, he's not going to get a lot of... He, he's. I don't think he's going to start this year at any point in time, just due to his age. And uh, we're definitely trending young to, as a, trending to a younger team. So he. I think he's going to be... He makes he makes a few appearances off the bench. Maybe there's a game where where the kids are making a bunch of mistakes, and he comes in to try to like calm things down a little bit, like late in the game. But I don't, I can't see him making more than five, six appearances off the bench this year. Just again, dude, he's 37. He, I don't think he can physically match uh, anyone's speed anymore on the on the pitch. Those are just like young guys. I think he. I think it's. He's going to take more of a backseat this year and do more of like a mentorship kind of role. Yeah, and uh, talking about the young guys in the midfield, we got Bruno Lapa uh, out of Wake Forest. I believe he was ACC Midfielder of the Year at one point. Something like that. I think definitely first team, and he's only 22 now. So another one of those really young guys that could have an impact if he sees the field. Yeah, I, I'm actually very excited for him because he's definitely in. He's almost in the same boat as uh, Dean on the back line, in my opinion. A backup guy, but definitely has – it's going to be a lot tougher for him to break through in that midfield with Akinode, Asidu, all of those guys. But he could get a couple games here and there, you know, definitely appearances off the bench. But I really liked his uh, – in the ATL game, I thought he had that little uh, creativity to him. You know, DJ like creativity, no, obviously not at the same level. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is a um, – I need you guys to look this up. It's ridiculous. Just look up Bruno Lapa, like goal or something. It should come up. He had this insane goal at uh, Wake Forest. Like I'm talking ridiculously, like upper 90, one touch. It was crazy. But I mean, if that can translate to the professional game, uh, the sky is the limit for this guy, honestly. Along with Lapa, another young guy in the midfield, listed as a midfielder, James Gervania. I thought he would be a forward, but I guess he is a midfielder. Uh, First USL Academy pro, not product. Uh, first USL Academy signing for the Legion, uh, formerly of the Houston Dash Academy, committed to Wake Forest. Tons of upsides to him. What are your thoughts? He looked Wait, like. Can, I do mean, you mean the Houston Dash Academy? <laughs> One at a time. <laughs> <laughs> 
I uh, Gunner go. Okay. Um, no, he he looked decent from what I saw. I mean, obviously, he's one of those guys that I haven't like seen a ton of footage on. I mean, totally different from his brother. Obviously, I could talk about him, but I'm not going to for obvious purposes. Um, but he is one of those young guys who is still under 20 and could be one of the future stars of the USL if he if he gets his chance. And I mean, I'm not sure how it works with him um, delaying his admittance to wake or if he's like, what's going to happen with all that. But um, I think it's good that we have one of those academy players because it like if we can get one, that means in the future we can definitely land more. Oh, yeah. What you got um, on the rest? Well, Ethan, I think you mean the Houston Dynamo Academy. Uh, the Dash oh, is yeah. their the the women. affiliate. <laughs> no, it, they're women. Isn't the Houston Dash is the women? Yeah. Oh, did you say women's or USL? I thought you said USL. I said USWL, US Women. Oh, okay. I was so confused there for a minute. Our, I was... uh, our, our, I forget the actual name, the name of that league, or well, what the like acronym is for the league, but uh. You got the Dynamo and you got the Dash. Um, yeah, the NWS, I believe. I think so. Uh, that sounds that sounds that sounds more right. Um, I have, again, I haven't seen a whole lot of stuff on uh, Sylvania. Uh, from what I've heard and from the few clips I've seen, he he seems like a fighter. He seems like he's he's hungry. He he'll he's ready to go in and give it everything he has. And I I think this is a solid move before he goes to Wake Forest. I think this is definitely going to help his career a lot. If he can go in and play against some, against some pros, then he can go into college. So he should be able to be fine there, I imagine. Yeah, uh, was it against ATL? I remember seeing him. The dude's 18, and he lost the ball multiple occasions against the ATL. But the thing was, he was pushing grown men off the ball to get it back, which I just thought was insane as an 18-year-old. He was just – I mean, he's these, are like, these are like – These are like, uh, what is it, second – second string ATL guys, which is still saying something. They're decent. You know, they gotta be decent to make that Atlanta roster. That was just uh, insane for me. Speaking yeah, of ATL, but, yeah, still disappointed about Williams, man. I mean you gotta man. you gotta like, feel you gotta feel super happy for him. I mean it's a huge move, but at the same time like he was one of those guys I was so excited to see play for us this year. That attack would be so nasty with him. It'd be ridiculous. If we had him, I remember we were talking about it. Like, oh, what if JJ came, you know, just throwing it around, all oh, like it's not going to happen. And it actually happened. And we're like, oh, shoot, dang, this is going to be awesome. And then, like, two, three days later, we're like, oh, well, there goes that. As soon as he scored that cracking free kick goal against that, uh, the Guatemalan team, the was like, we are taking you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, was it, I was excited to see him along, uh, obviously, Brett, who we already touched on. And then Brian Wright coming back on that. Uh, is he? He's on a multi-year deal, right? Yeah, yes. I believe so. Yeah, multi-year deal from the Revolution. Uh, yeah, pretty much just a beast. I feel like he's going to take that step. Last year, he was just getting. He didn't get many minutes in the MLS at all. So he getting to the USL and having that many minutes straight away, it obviously takes time to adapt. And with that, with a lot of our guys, you know, they got that first year under their belt. This their year to take that big stride and brian wright was already crazy you know last year he was just beasting the field so with that year of experience uh going into this year i feel like he can just take that next step become even a bigger beast and honestly i feel like he could push uh push for that mvp and take it from prosper this year i think another thing is i really 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 want to see how brian wright lines up next to um nico brett and sure, at the same time, I really want to see how uh, Mensa does, Rudolph Mensa. But because I mean, he he just he was a stud against Atlanta in the preseason game. I mean, you can't deny that. But um, based on experience and guys that I feel like could score goals and be super consistent, I feel like Brett and Wright up top could be really dangerous. Definitely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We're definitely gonna be loaded up front this year. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, we I knew that. I want to see who ends up claiming spots. I mean, I'm just looking at this like, what is it? We got Mensa, Kasim, Hoffman, Brett, right? Like, it's basically pick your poison. 
Oh, Hoffman. I guess we can touch on Hoffman now. Hoffman. But Hoffman. You know what? I, I said earlier that uh, Lopez was basically the face of the Legion. I kind of want to take that back and say Hoffman was last year. Yeah, I was, uh, Hoffman definitely had a presence until he was heating up, actually, until he got hurt. He actually yeah. had a couple goals, you know, and then like unfortunate the injury. Yeah, and then, uh, what is it, Brett coming in kind of just, uh, I don't know, put a damper on his chance to get in that starting lineup. But oh, yeah. you think he's going to uh, challenge for that spot this year, maybe get a starting spot? Or do you think he's going to be stuck behind Wright and uh, Brett? That's a good question. I, I think it depends on his form because if he if he wants to continue playing like he did right before he was injured, then sure, I think he has an amazing chance to challenge for that spot. But if we see the Hoffman that was, aside from the Louisville game, just dinking balls right to the goalie, not being able to finish on target, and just really having weak shots with his left foot, I mean, I don't know. It depends on his form. Yeah, definitely. I personally, I think he's not. Uh, I think he's going to be that guy that comes off the bench and provides the spark. He's going to get the occasion start because it's Chandler Hoffman we're talking about. You can't just sit him on the bench for the whole year. Right. But the occasional start, uh, it might be a three-man rotation. I kind of feel like Brett's always going to get in that starting 11 unless he's completely out of form or hurt, obviously. But that's another good thing, this whole – forward situation that we have it's a good thing to have so many good forwards because like you can take Hoffman let's take Hoffman for example uh he's on the bench you have Hoffman on the bench you're down 206th minute you slap Hoffman on okay say if Brett gets injured you have Hoffman on the bench slap him into the starting lineup you're set you know it's just crazy the depth and we have that young guy uh Rudolph Mensa from Ghana now he's just gonna I feel like breakout candidate of the year if he gets the minutes now now that we're not in the Open Cup, it changed a lot of things. Oh, but yeah. I feel like he can still challenge. He's more of a wing guy, it looks like. So he can challenge for that outside wing to prosper. So what are your thoughts on Minta? Looked really good against Atlanta. That goal he had was so smooth. I mean, it looked like he was like had been used to playing in at least USL-level play for a while, even though he hadn't. So I'm really excited to see him hopefully get some minutes hopefully score some goals because like as young as he is um and being from ghana i mean i want to say the level of play is completely different but i mean i don't really know so i can't speak on that i mean it's definitely a different style of game obviously you're going to be playing a lot faster and stuff but just how his how his skill set can transition is going to be something that a lot of people should pay attention to because he looked really really good against atlanta and it it should be an exciting year for him for sure i think he's going to be Basically, if Pros Rast come off for any reason, he gets uh like he just gets subbed off. He gets subbed off. He gets hurt, or he's just not feeling it for the game. You you can slap Mintz in there, and it's it's not oh it's not that's gonna be a one for one ratio, but it's gonna be pretty close. I think they're two similar talents, and I I think I think they're both uh young players who are gonna be up on an upper trend for a while. Yeah, and it's crazy just to think that he's born in 01. He's only 18. Uh, the the thing that I notice and I love about Minsa, he brings passion and that fieriness to the game. Like against ATL, he was chirping at people. He's been in the U.S. a week. Okay, I'm assuming he's never been to the U.S. A kid from Ghana, he's hungry, which I love. I love that he's hungry. He wants to get on that field, score goals, help the team out, and he – Basically, I feel like he has something to prove for himself, and I love that about the guy. But definitely, he's he's honestly, if he gets the minutes, he's my breakout candidate of the year. Like the newcomer of the year, if you want to call it, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the guy to look out for. Because, I mean, the sky's the limit for the dude, even though we've only seen like one game for him uh, in person. He just impressed me that, that much. It's just crazy. But uh, I want to move on to more of this COVID-19 stuff. Because... You know, USL's delayed till May 10th. I believe training's delayed until April. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Like April 5th or April 10th as of now. Uh, the USL so. announced it a couple days ago. But uh, I, I've seen guys, they're still getting their work and still going out to the fields, which is good to see. But, I mean, it's just crazy because obviously they're not going to travel home, which is kind of unfortunate for them. They just basically have to sit around for almost two months in a city most of them have never been in. 
you know, mm-hmm. and just foreign. A lot of our guys are first year players uh, to the professional game, like Bergman and Malfa. Uh, so, I mean, that's just crazy. What are your thoughts on this whole like COVID-19 thing? Because we've never really seen a thing like this before happen. Definitely not in our live. Like, I mean, sure, I'm only 21. So it's like not that impressive for me to say, yeah, I've never experienced something like this in my life. But just for for sports in general, for everything to be put on hold for who knows. I mean, people are already saying like it could be going heavy into uh, the summer months, like even July. Like that is crazy to just think because um, around the world, countries are just dealing with it completely differently. And I know Italy's been hit super hard. Italy's been hit harder than China, if you can believe it. Oh, um, oh yeah. But just for something like it is a super tough situation for people who aren't home in a new place they've never been and they can't really go outside for the most part. I mean, you can go outside, but like just isolating yourself, social distancing, all that stuff makes it so much more difficult. And I mean, like you have to feel for these guys who um, are coming from Africa and like are just not used to anything like this brand new country. I mean, it's, it's, totally different i mean we've never experienced anything like this before so to say it's difficult for them is probably an understatement so just time will tell and i said that earlier but like it's it's so unpredictable right now because i mean we don't know if the virus is just going to keep getting worse if it's going to slow down if if our preventive measures are doing anything right now i mean we just can't tell so i mean we really don't know um I, like you said difficult it difficult being it being difficult for the uh, players is an understatement i would agree with that i don't we don't know if it's going to take either an italy turn or it's going to become basically asia's starting to recover right now they have plans to restart their sports here in the next month um ideally like we can get back to that kind of point in the ne- in the next month or so uh basically take that kind of turn but I don't know if our preventive measures have been doing a whole lot since it's become obvious that a lot of people aren't following any of the quarantine procedures at all. Uh, people are still going out in Florida for spring break. Uh, yeah. Our beaches are still open. Uh, we, so we, I don't, I don't, I can't say what kind of turn it will, it will take. And maybe the, maybe the when it starts getting warmer, it's the it'll start slowing down the disease enough so where we can kind of just uh, nip it in the bud. But it's been mutating a lot. I don't really know. Uh, I I can't. I don't even really want to give a prediction on like when we could start seeing a uh, game start up again. Just because I generally, this is one of the few times where I have absolutely no idea. Couldn't even almost try to tell you. Yeah, and uh, let's just say May tenth, uh, games resume. May sixteenth, we go back and we start against St. Louis. There's only so much soccer you can play in a week in a month, in two months, you know, with all these games being backed up, do you realistically seeing the season end uh, where it usually ends, or do you see it being pushed back, like, one, two months? I honestly, because, I mean, weather affects a bunch of teams, especially in the Eastern Conference, so I don't know how far they want to push it back. I mean, obviously, soccer is a, a more tolerable sport when it comes to weather, um, compared to like baseball, for example, I mean, you can't push baseball back. Um, but I mean, soccer is a sport that sure you can play in bad weather and snow in some places, but I'm sure a lot of, a lot of teams don't want to deal with that for purpose of like, for purposes of like the field or whatever, just want to avoid that. So I'm not sure if they'd consider cutting the season short. Um, or maybe if it gets bad enough, only playing each team once compared to twice, but ju- I mean, just some ideas that you could toss around. I think it's still a little early to decide on that, but I- I'm not sure. Um, while w- while uh, the U.S. soccer s- system has enough downs, out- enough of an off season to where we could realistically push it back and still give the players enough of an off season to recover, the- I think the issue lies with there's a lot of teams in the USL that don't own their own stadium, and therefore. Maybe whoever owns stadium is not going to agree, going to agree to let them use the field any longer after the like set time, and then it would come down to well, those teams that are out of a lease, then can they find a new field for the rest of the season? I don't know how that would end up working. 
Yeah, I could. Uh, I definitely could see that. Like a bunch of the teams playing baseball stadiums and the minor leagues, if their season gets their season's already going to get pushed back. You know, they have so many games; they might just be trying to pile them on, uh, and that leaves no time for soccer. So, I mean, we'll just have to. It's a waiting game at this point. We'll have to wait and see what uh what goes down. But I want to move in. If you guys are done talking about that topic, I want to move in, shed some light. Uh, not shed some light. Uh, bring some positivity to this and talk about something a little cool. Uh, we haven't talked about this yet. It's a sweet home kit that the Legion put out uh, probably about a month ago or something. You know, a fire kit, in my opinion, definitely worth the money. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on it? Because I definitely think it's cool as heck. I mean, I love the color. I think it's a great little switch up from the white and black kits. Uh, I mean, it just it looks awesome on the field. I think it looked really cool at night, too. Uh, looking at some of the stuff from the photo shoots, I mean, those photos were so cool. I mean, I, I really want one of the jerseys now because I only have the white one. But um, but I think it was a really cool concept. I love the flag on the back collar. I think that should be on every jersey. I mean, I love the Alabama flag, like how it was incorporated. I think that would look really cool on the other jerseys as well. Um, or even incorporating, like, the hammer down with the flag on it instead of the um, the black one with just a little tiny um, – the whatever it is the little design on the back um but i mean just in general i think the red was like the perfect color they could have chosen for the third kit and at the same time i don't want to see that like completely replace one of the white or the black kits but i mean at the same time i want it to be used i want it to be because i think it's a great like advertising mechanism i think people like stuff like that especially in the usl when like a bunch of people may just go to games for whatever to be with friends or whatever, not actually care about the soccer. I think it will draw some really cool attention to some of the Legion guys and the team itself. Um, I I bought the jersey when it got released. I love the jersey. I love the little flag on the back, like Gunnar was saying. My only issue with it is I wish they had done like a little more like with the design, at least like a like a side stripe or just a little bit more because to keep it look from looking just like a red T-shirt. With the logo on it, that's my only real gripe with it. I love the I love having a third kit. I love it being red. I love the state flag being on it. I just wish they'd done a little more with, I guess, like more little details or just, uh, I guess, make it pop a little more. I was gonna I say I, I love how the black. I love how the black incorporates the sparks on the side. I mean, oh. like that is such a cool concept. And I mean, I know the white. The white with the gold, the gold standard kit, like that is such a simplistic design, but it just looks so cool. I mean, I don't know what it is like specifically, but just like how it looks when you're wearing it. I mean, it's just it's a cool kit in general. But yeah. I mean, the spark, the sparks are a way that could have like, I don't know, incorporated a design that was a little different, but also like made it pop out, stand out a little more. I definitely agree with that. I love the little sparks in the black kit and the white kit. Like in my opinion, any white kit would like non-natural color on it like the gold you don't see that on a white kit that often uh it just makes it pop and like almost it's so simple but you can see it a mile away it's just mm -hmm. one of those kits that's just so clean but wrapping up legion talk do you guys have anything else you want to talk about legion throw it out now i think we got basically everything we needed to cover i mean there was Pretty a bunch of time. yeah i think i think we cover all we need to cover on the legion all right, one last thing before we wrap up this podcast. One last topic, XFL to Birmingham. I'm not opposed to it at all. I think it'd be a great idea. I mean, even with the Iron uh, and the, the AAF last year, it was a positive experience. I mean, fans, like, I know the turnouts weren't great, but, I mean, that was the case for the entire league. Um, but, I mean, just... The XFL has been something I've enjoyed watching on TV. I mean, I'm a St. Louis Battlehawks fan, but I mean, hey, if Birmingham wants to get a team, I'll switch that instantly. Um, I don't. I'm not against the idea, but I can't say I'm also. I can't say I'm a proponent of the idea just because we've had Birmingham. They just had what four professional football teams, and none of them have ever lasted. And I guess the only way I'd be really talked into it is if we have a way to where Birmingham's not footing too much of a bill for it. Just because of the history we have with 
not a single team, not a single professional football, football team from Birmingham has ever lasted, and that's my biggest worry. I I would say. Did you guys know so, that in the nineties? I want to say the nineties. It was either the nineties or the early two thousands. Birmingham had a CFL team. Did you guys know that? Really? Yeah. Yep. One, CFL team. Yeah. They expanded into America. They probably had like I don't know four or five teams, and Birmingham was one of them. Where the that was the Barracudas, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, don't but, know. I think that's so cool, but yeah, what is this? In the past week, I want to say week or two weeks, uh, there's the city council is pushing for next developing actually. So mm-hmm. it sounds like they want, it, especially with a protective stadium coming up, that big new. I don't even know how much money it's going to cost. Uh, <laughs> getting there day by day but i mean finally a new stadium finally finally because yeah. uh, i'm a uob I, i'm a uob fan and whenever i go to blazer games as much as i love the team and the city just legion field i have to admit it's kind of it's kind of a dump like i've i have a good thing about legion field my three years in birmingham like no one says hey you have to go to ch- like check out a game at Legion Field. Like, there's nothing. Um, yeah, there's no. I can't. I can't think of any, any positives like I like about the stadium. Thinking back to my games, I can remember. I can remember all like the plays that we made, but I can't remember anything. About the, I don't. Remember, there's nothing pops about the stadium at all, other than being sort of historic. Sort of historic. Uh, a pain to get to. All concrete. None of the seats are comfortable. Not, not in a good area. I remember I've been there one time. It was so many years ago. It's whenever the U.S. women's national team played Haiti. And they were supposed to play Australia, but Australia was like in a lockout for money or something. Oh. So it was Haiti, and they got thrashed 8-0 or something. Second round of CISO, so I mean, it's all right. But uh, what is it? Going along with Protective Stadium, which is supposed to open in 2021 for the World Games, who knows if that's going to happen. BJCC getting that $123 million renovation, I believe. Um, going off the top of my head with that number, pretty, yeah, 123. That's pretty, yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah, uh, 18 month renovation, supposed to start in April, April 4th, maybe somewhere around there, early April. Complete revamp. Uh, I don't know if you guys seen the renderings of it, of it at all, but it looks insane. I was not expecting it to look that good on renderings. Granted, those are renderings, but if yeah. that's the final product or close to, they have like a big glass wall. That is a big boost for Birmingham. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've only seen a few photos of it, but, I mean, at the same time, like, you you have to be excited for it. Because, I mean, I know city council has been really, really trying to, like, change Birmingham for the better. Like, not have it be a dying city like it was 10 years ago. And they've already oh, made yeah. so many advancements. And it's been nothing but positive for the most part. Um, so, it's definitely exciting. I think it's going to help us. We're getting the NBA G League team. Uh, the Lake Erie team is coming down here. Mm-hmm. We're going to be able to get better, better, uh, better artists for concerts. More consistent, a more consistent concert lineup. It's going to be, it's going to be more fun. The uh, I forget what the classics always called. It's always like it's always a UA, UAB or Bama or Auburn will come into Birmingham and play one of their big games in, B, in the BDCC. But I forget what the actual like game itself was called. It might, it might just be the the. Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember it all actually. I'll have to I'll have to look it up later. Yeah, but I want to touch on that uh, G League team though. That's crazy though. Uh, in my in my opinion, I was I was not expecting to get a G League team at all in fifteen years. I mean, even though Birmingham is known for their was it you're the major minor league city, you know, <laughs> uh, you get all those secondary teams and such. But I mean, I feel like. It's, it's going to be a blast because it's right downtown, hard to downtown, like Legion. They're in the downtown. Uh, college kids, you know, UAB kids living on campus. It's a very easy access for them. Uh, obviously going to be cheap. So I think they're going to pull in numbers, honestly. For sure. Oh, yeah. A decent amount for a G League team. Because I know, um, what is it, like the Celtics affiliate, the main Red Claws, they play at a place in Portland, Maine. Tiny, tiny place. But they pack the house every night. Like even if Taco Bell is not there, uh, they pack the house, which is which is awesome. And I hope Birmingham's not going to pack B- the BJCC, but for a G League team. But I mean, definitely exciting. For but sure. I mean, 
it would be cool to have a basketball, baseball, soccer, uh, and maybe football. Who knows? Hey. Only time will tell. Yeah. And hockey. Can't forget about hockey. And fear hockey. Yeah, that's that's one thing though. I, I'm just gonna go off topic here. Hockey. They aren't pulling numbers. They're not getting good numbers at all. And it's probably partially to do with their location. It's so far out of downtown. It's about half an hour south. Yeah. But they are, I believe, second to last in the SPHL in uh what is it? Attendance. Attendance. Yeah. But one good thing is they play with it. Where they play is funded by the city, pretty much. I mean, they have to pay rent, obviously, I'd assume. But besides that, you know, definitely need to see a boost next season. In that. Uh, I mean, anything else you guys want to we'll wrap it up here? That's it for me. That's it for Sweet. me. Sweet. Well, this has been episode three of the Birmingham Sports Podcast. Thank you for sticking with us. If you stick all the way through, uh, still learning, still learning, still getting it getting the uh, kinks worked out but drop a comment below i know we had a couple comments so far but be sure to follow us the plug time now follow us on instagram birmingham sports follow us on twitter uh you can find it at uh let me look it up real quick because i can't remember uh Beham sports underscore and then we got our blog birmingham or Beham sport.com be sure to follow that uh pretty oh yeah you guys want to plug anything i'm good <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess Birmingham Sports Episode 3. Thanks for listening, guys.